I'm Casey Vance, Executive Director of the Ames History Museum, and we're so pleased to have you here tonight for our special history talk, Personally Speaking, Some Things You Don't Know About Me, presented by Wayne Plain. A couple of housekeeping things quick before we get started. Um, first, I'm going to go ahead and put a poll up on the screen here um, to get a better idea of how many people are watching with you. So go ahead and participate in that if you're willing to. That gives us just a better sense of the attendance for tonight. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, this program is being recorded. So if you need to leave early or if you lose connection, no worries, the recording will be emailed to you tomorrow. So look out for that email. Um, and if you have questions for the speaker um, during the lecture, I encourage you to use the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring the questions throughout the lecture and we'll have some time at the end to ask um, Wayne the questions and have him answer. And um, you can also use the chat feature um, to talk with other attendees or ask questions in there as well. We'll be monitoring that too. Um, and finally, I'd like to recognize our program sponsor tonight, which is Greater Iowa Credit Union. Um, this program is given um, in a, due to a grant from Greater Iowa Credit Union, so we're really pleased to have them um, support us in that way. And now I will go ahead and pass it over to AHM board member Sharon Worth to introduce our speaker tonight. Thanks, Casey. Good, mo good morning. Now, hello, I'm Sharon Worth. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Wayne Clinton. Wayne joined the History Museum Board of Directors a couple of years ago. Before that time, I was barely acquainted with him, although our years as elected officials overlapped for a few years. Since he joined the Museum Board, we have worked together on several committees, and I have learned more about his many accomplishments, and there are many. I could list some, but I will let Wayne uh, talk about them as, as he gets started. Wayne has lived through the times of being called colored, Negro, and some other unpleasant terms, I'm sure. Segregation, separate but equal, to integration, to today. A fascinating journey. Wayne will share these details. I believe you will enjoy tonight's presentation and learn some things about his life that you didn't know. So take it away, Wayne. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it truly is uh, my pleasure uh, to uh, speak to you this evening. Uh, I wish to thank everyone that will be joining in tonight. I especially want to acknowledge my sincere appreciation to the Ames History Museum for giving me this opportunity. Sharon Worth from the Board of Directors and Casey Vance uh, uh, from Executive Director thought that reflection of my life experience coming to Ames some 55 years ago uh, would make an interesting presentation. Okay, I'm trying to get it to move down, but it won't move. It's somehow it's uh, the slide would not slide down, Casey. Hmm. Okay. My full screen is up. Oh, okay. There we go. There we go. Now Good. I did. Okay. Uh, my talk is entitled Personally Speaking Some Things You Don't Know About Me. With the museum's commitment to sharing stories about people of color, especially those past and present story, past and present that have made a significant contribution here in Ames, I thought years from now, Ames residents might want to hear my story. Tonight, I will share my reflections uh, as a black man growing up in the Midwest leaving a comfortable, familiar environment, even with its history of segregation and navigating to Iowa to build a new life. I was born March 7th, 1941 in St. Louis, Missouri. My sister and I were raised by my grandmother and step-grandfather, both with a strong Christian faith. And you can see them there in this picture. 
My sister was a year and six months older. During my early youth, I could not recall us having much, but there was always an environment of love and comfort. I was too young to understand the segregated society in parts of the US, but in St. Louis, African-Americans and whites lived in segregated neighborhoods. Practically everything we needed to survive was available in our own neighborhood. Like most children, we had as much fun as possible. Shooting marbles and playing stickball were the main things to keep me busy. Most of my early friends were from my grandmother's church. From an early age, I led a sheltered life, spending most of my youth either at church, scouting, or at school. I met my best friend, Eulis Wheaton, at church, and we developed a special bond lasting even to this day. Now, this photo, you might think that I was perhaps wanting to be a future jazz pianist, pianist, but that's not the case. I was educated in a black elementary school uh, because schools were segregated with only students and teachers of the same race. From the elementary school, I attended Beaumont High in 1956. I was one of 12 African-Americans to integrate Beaumont. At that time, it was predominantly all white. I was, I was able to go there because of the 1954 Supreme Court decision in Brown v. versus Board of Education of Topeka. Some of you might be able to kind of see that on the screen, uh, what I'm looking at is kind of blocked uh, by our picture uh, and that of uh, members of the museum. But here is an article that appeared in the Ames uh, Tribune that talked about uh, the ending of school segregation uh, where it was ruled uh, unconstitutional. The, uh, this decision outlawed racial segregation in public schools, and therefore uh, it made it possible for many of us that uh, uh, lived in segregated neighborhoods to be able to attend uh, perhaps white dominated schools. It is important to note that my grandfather's job made it possible for us to move from a predominantly all black neighborhood into a white dominated neighborhood. Our new home made it possible for me to attend Beaumont, where I was the only, we, where we were the only black family living in this neighborhood. In less than a year, several whites put their homes up for sale. Soon with white flight, more homes became available and other black families bought homes on surrounding streets. In 1956, we moved into a new home at 4006 Natural Bridge. Across the street was Fair, Fairground Park and we were one block from my high school. Now, I point this out because this article here says that 15 were hurt uh, and white Negro pool riot that was picked up by the Ames Tribune. Uh, but what really took place at that particular time was that in 1949, uh, St. Louis uh, had one of the largest outdoor swimming pools in the city, but blacks were not allowed to swim along with whites. And a decision was made uh, to allow this to take place. As a result, uh, it was on June 21st, 1949, that some 30 to 40 Blacks came to the pool to swim. They swam alongside white children without any problem until a group of white teenagers surrounded 
the fences by the pool and threatened the swimmers. The crowd grew and black youth had to be escorted uh, from the pool by local police, but this did not stop them from being attacked. A rumor got out that a black man had been had killed a white person and soon the crowd grew to over 1,000. It was estimated that it took 150 police officers to put down the riot. The crowd did not fully disappear until around midnight. So to avoid another eruption, the mayor decided that the best decision would be to segregate the pools again. Now, what's interesting in this article in the Ames Tribune is that it listed almost 200 uh, officers uh, were needed and the crowd was much larger. In my research, what I found out is that depending on who you talk to, there were different stories as to the size of the crowd and the number of police officers. But in 1950, it was ordered by the federal courts to integrate the pools of St. Louis. Now, since the park and pools were so close to my home, I enjoyed swimming there. The pools remained open for a few more years, but white attendance dropped sharply. And for some reason, the pool was closed. Early, I mentioned, my grandfather, who was in the Teamsters Union and eventually became union representative of Local 610. In the late 50s, a merger occurred between the Teamsters and the AFL CIO. And my grandfather was then the only African American union representative at the union headquarters in South St. Louis. Now, he and my sister attended the 1963 March on Washington, and he later uh, went to Selma, Alabama, during the time African-Americans marched to gain their voting rights. Now, you'll notice that this was also a caption from the Ames History Museum collection, and the purpose of that march in DC was to dramatize the need for jobs and freedom. My sister and my grandfather uh, talked and shared some stories about this remarkable experience, but my grandfather never talked about any discrimination that he may have faced uh, in the workplace. His example of navigating the segregated society that he faced rubbed off on me in later years. In 1967, my grandfather, Tommy Haynes, uh, was featured in a new release, newspaper release, and it said that he was one of the first black Teamsters uh, business agents anywhere, and he retired after 17 years as a representative of local 751 and the movers union, local 610. And here's a picture of uh, my grandfather with two of the union bosses uh, in their uh, handshake, giving him a, a great send off. Now my experience led me to understand the harsh realities. My high school experience led me to understand the harsh realities of a segregated environment. Given that I was a four sports athlete, I was insulated from some of the adversities that my friends, family, and community members experienced. I could always count on some of the girls though to help me with my schoolwork. I was all about being the best athlete that I possibly could. Once the athletic events ended, so did any further social interaction. Never attending school parties, proms, 
or any other school activities. After navigating through the high school experience, the idea of a higher education came about. It's important to note that most of my teachers left a bad impression on me. And I felt there was no effort to really get to know me and to offer any additional help that I may have needed. My basketball coach, Tom Stanton, and track coach Bill Miller were the exceptions. They both showed a general interest in me and always giving me encouragement and letting me know that I had the ability uh, to compete at the college collegiate level. They were receiving interest from some colleges. So in January of 1960, St. Louis University offered me a full ride scholarship in basketball and track. Not feeling academically prepared for St. Louis University, I still decided to go because it was in my hometown and I would be the only member of my family to go to college. My poor study habits in high school finally caught up with me. I rarely attended classes and had a disagreement with the freshman basketball coach, which led me to drop out of school before completing my freshman year. I came close to joining the Army. Looking back, I can only imagine what my life might have been if I had joined the Army. Now, in this particular jump, uh, I set the meet and school record, 23, six and a half at that particular time. I'll come back and talk about specifically this particular slide in a few minutes. My sister in the meantime was able to get me a job at Washington University. And I was able to go to, to afford my own apartment and to regain a relationship with my mother. That also resulted in her living with me. Reality struck when I had, after paying the essential expenses and having just under $20 left from my paycheck, I realized what a big mistake it was for me leaving school and it was time for some real change. While attending a high school basketball game, my former track coach uh, saw me and asked if I had an interest in going back to college. He introduced me to an assistant from Northeast Missouri State College now Truman State University that was there on a recruiting trip. There I was given the opportunity to scrimmage with some of the players on the basketball team. I must have impressed the coach because both the basketball and track coach offered me a full ride scholarship pending making at least a 2.0 grade point average my first semester. Since I had dropped out of college earlier and had poor grades, they wanted to be sure that they could depend on me. Coach Gardner, my track coach, told me to always sit in the front of my classes to ask questions and not to skip classes. He told me he would be checking with my professors and he expected a good report. Now I was determined that this time I would be a serious student and buckle down and I made the necessary grades. By then I had matured and realized that a quality education was essential. Now, what you see on the screen now is a picture of the St. Louis Arch. It started construction in 1963 and was open uh, for the public in 1965. Uh, now, it's important to note that racism and injustice were frequent. It was a way of living. 
And so to put this in perspective, on May 19, 1961, the St. Louis Board of Aldermen voted 20 to four to ban racial discrimination at restaurants, diners, taverns, theaters, and other places of public accommodations. But seven years earlier, in 1954, the Alderman Board voted 17 to 10 to pro uh, protect the notion that business owners could refuse service for reasons of race or creed. History shows that peaceful protests eventually wore down the resistance. Now the civil rights movement was slowly changing America and African-Americans were seeing improvements in race relations as laws were passed to protect every American's constitutional rights, regardless of color, race, sex, or national origin. There was still resistance in some parts of Missouri and stronger resistance in most Southern states. Now, as you can see this handsome looking fellow there, Starting in 1962-64, as an athlete, while competing and traveling to other colleges in our conference, I was now exposed to segregated treatment from businesses and fans attending our road games. The use of the N-word and other degrading comments were commonplace. Their hostile actions towards our African-American players only made me more competitive. And I had some of my best scoring games playing before fans that taunted us. Due to some cities still practicing segregated eating facilities, our coaches would always arrange for our team to eat on the bus rather than being denied the ability to eat with our white teammates. In 1964, while on a track trip, from a meet in Kansas. We stopped at a restaurant in Kansas City, Missouri. We all went in, sat down, preparing to order our food. The waiter never came to our table to take our food orders. Some of my track mates were already eating their food when our coach noticed that we had not been served. So, he asked the waiter about this and was told that they had orders not to serve blacks in their restaurant. Coach Gardner was angry and had all of us to immediately get up out of our seat and leave the place. From that point on, the coach made sure we all could eat at a restaurant or we would have food ordered and brought to our bus or the cars that we were riding in. It was not long after this that all food establishments ended the practice of segregation and served everyone with the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This act opened public accommodations such as lunch counters and bus stations. It made possible the large scale progress in breaking down uh, job segregation. Now Kirksville, Missouri, where the college was located was good for me. No similar issues occurred like this. During my college years, I received numerous athletic honors in both basketball and track. My success in athletics possibly made it, uh, uh, possibly played a part as to how I was accepted in treating among the student body and the community at large. So as you can see that these were a few clips. Uh, in this particular clip, I was, uh, announced in the newspaper as the conference scoring leader. 
and my friend Florent McMillan was recognized as the leading rebounder in the conference. And in the second one, it happens to be a shot of me uh, hitting a layup against uh, Springfield uh, Bears. And my other event beside the long jump was running the hurdles. And this happened to be in the indoor conference track meet, uh, even though the long jump was my best event. So, as I've mentioned about my athletic endeavors, uh, in 1989, I was honored in being inducted into the Northeast Missouri State University Athletic Hall of Fame. And as you can see from the, the plaque here, uh, that this depicts uh, that great opportunity. While in college, I met the love of my life, Edna Young. After dating a while, she agreed to marry me. We were married in 1963, and our first child, Antoine, was born in 1964. In the fall, at the start of the new school year, we moved into marriage student housing on the college campus. A year later, in 1965, our daughter Danielle was born. But I now had someone to keep me focused on completing my education and getting a job. She was instrumental in making sure I had good study habits, assisting me with my assignments, and later reminded me that she should have also had her name on my diploma, which I received in 1966. Now here's a photo of my grandparents coming to my college graduation. They were so proud, as I said earlier, being the only family member to graduate from college. But this was a special uh, time for me uh, to have them present because they never came and saw me when I was competing uh, in athletics. Uh, during those years. Over the next three summers, I went back to school and received my MA in physical education in 1969. Edna was and is still my rock. Our third child, Aaron, was born here in Ames in 1971, and I was able to be at the hospital and witness his delivery at Mary Greeley. This was special because I missed the birth of our other children because I was away competing at a track meet. I am the man I am today because of her support. Currently, we have three children, Antoine, Danielle, and Aaron, and seven granddaughters, two grandsons, and five great-grandchildren. A month before graduating from college, I saw a posting for a teaching position in Ames, Iowa. I was excited about finding a job near Des Moines so that I would be able to attend the Drake Relays each year. On a weekend in May of 1966, I drove to Ames for my interview. I arrived two hours earlier and drove around the city in order to get a feel for what I thought or imagined life would be like for me and my family if I got a job off and it if I got a job offer and I would accept it. While driving around the city, guess what? there was not one person that looked like me walking the street. So I was confident I would not be hired. I met with Principal Don Carlson and Superintendent Walt Hetzel. My interview dragged on and on and on, as I recall, lasting some two and a half hours. I was at ease and answered their questions because I knew I would not be offered the job. 
After this long interview process, I was asked to leave the room so that they could consult. I was certain I would be given a polite response and they would get back to me with their decision. When I came back in the room, I was informed that they wanted to hire me as a seventh grade geography teacher at Welch Junior High. I was shocked. After regaining my composure, I asked additional questions and inquired about an additional coaching position. I was assured that this was possible. I then asked the principal, now get this, if they would give me one week to make a decision. Now, My reason to them was that my wife was back in St. Louis and would not have a clue of what life would be like for us and our children. I wanted to be sure that she and I would be comfortable moving to Ames at this point in our life. I told them that in my request that I would hate to take this job and in a couple of years, we would be unhappy and want to leave. Since I was the first African-American teacher hired at this school, I felt it was important uh, to both of us for this to work. So Principal Carson agreed and gave me his phone number and told me to have my wife call with any questions. And after getting answers, to some questions and encouragement from Coach Gardner, my college track coach, we made the decision to take the job. A week later, I called back and accepted the position. Looking back, it never crossed my mind about how my family and I would be accepted. My mindset was one of belief in oneself striving to always have a positive attitude and to make the most of this opportunity. Reflecting on how I ended up in Ames, I'm convinced that it was because of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others fighting for equality, housing, education, voting rights, and a host of other things that contributed to me gaining employment, especially here. Prior to coming, Principal Carlson had talked to several apartment owners and they agreed to hold open a few places for us to choose when we arrived in Ames. We actually settled on our first apartment uh, on South 3rd Avenue by the DOT. And so with only a few items packed in a small trailer, we needed additional furniture and we were directed to go to home furniture store and talk to the owner, Warren Israel, and tell him that I was the new teacher hired in this school district and he would take care of us. We got what we needed and a good payment plan was agreed to. So in 1970, we bought our home at 16, our first home at 1610 Carroll, we now lived on the same block as my principal, Don and Mary Ann Carlson, and we were invited to join their families on many occasions. We are still living in the same house today. So at school, I was warmly welcomed by staff. What a relief. And I felt I had made a good decision to come here to teach. When I first met my students, we were connected in such a positive way. I later found out that I was the topic of conversation in most of my students' homes because they thought that I was cool and I immediately gained support from parents and others, uh, people in the community. So after a few weeks, 
we held a parent night so they could meet their uh, children's teachers and we could share some curriculum content. After the meeting, Sandy McNabb, a school board member and a parent came up to me and shared this comment. I quote, he told me that almost every night I was the topic of conversation and that it never came up that I was an African-American teacher. He said he had talked to the superintendent about integrating the teaching staffs in this school district and was not aware that I was hired until that night. So to make sure we got off to a good start, Mr. Carlson, my principal, made sure to group my wife and I up with other teachers and their spouses. They will forever hold a special place in my heart for their kindness, acceptance, and friendship. So on Fridays for several months, we had a social gathering at the homes of several of these teachers. And this was done to help facilitate a smooth transition to Ames. There were only a few African-Americans living in Ames and we slowly got to meet them and develop a social network. This was helpful because they were able to give us a good feel for Ames through their experiences. Those early years were difficult for us. We missed our family and friends back in St. Louis. We would drive back once a month, weather permitting, over the next three years, Gradually, we did make the adjustment to life here in Ames. My teaching and co coaching and officiating gave me a different exposure to Ames and surrounding communities in Iowa. In 1968, Jack Smalling got me started officiating high school basketball and football games. I was warmly accepted in many communities. I was the first African-American official working games in many of these communities. A few years later, I joined a football officiating crew with Bud Legg, Larry McCone, Esther Alexander, and we traveled all over the state uh, working games and our crew was assigned to officiate high school playoff and state championship games. Bud and I was assigned to work uh, on a college crew. This was in the Iowa conference. These games were held on Saturday. In basketball, Phil Johnson and I officiated numerous boys and girls games over the years. We were also assigned to work state tournaments, junior college games, and other tournaments. But it was in the 1970s that Bernie Saga, the executive director of the Iowa High School Athletic Association, recommended me to officiate in the Big Eight and the Missouri Valley Conference. Some would say that I broke the color barrier by being the first African-American official in both conferences. I was able to officiate six years at the division one level. Principal Carlson allowed me to leave early from school when I had midweek games. I needed to drive to most of my games because I had to teach the next day. The Iowa and Midwest weather posed many challenges. There were nights I relied on truckers to keep me awake. Most people traveling owned a CB, talking back and forth. My CB handle was the Black Knight, you figure. <laughs> was and it was recognized by truckers and the highway patrol. I would be talking to truckers trying to stay awake and a patrolman would break in and say, is that you Black Knight? Slow it down and be safe. 
Now the civil rights movement was now leading to the passage of more laws eliminating segregated practices on many fronts. The movement ended on April 4th, 1968 with the assassination of Dr. King in Memphis, Tennessee by James Earl Ray. This photo shows the caption again in the Ames Tribune that Alex was kind enough to be able to find. And before I uh, go a little bit further, I think it's basically important to recognize that Stokely Carmichael was a black power militant and he called Negroes to get guns and to take to the streets to retaliate for the execution of Dr. Martin Luther King. And violence did erupt in some of uh, almost a dozen US cities. But that of course was not my approach. I was in my second year of teaching on this tragic April 4th, 1968 date. I heard the news that Dr. King had been shot. My first response was of disbelief, then anger. So I dressed in my black suit and tie and went to school to share the tragic news with my students. This is when my life took on a new purpose and meaning. After that day, I had the following thoughts. I wondered, if there was any way I could be an instrument to enhance Dr. King's dream. How was this going to affect my children? What was the future going to be like for them? Would they have to defend themselves against the many cliches, the stereotypes and the hurtful language? I reflected on the 1963 demonstration in Washington, DC where Dr. King gave his, I have a dream speech. And I quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged uh, by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This had special meaning then and still resonates with me today. Even today, I still wonder what challenges my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and other African-American children will face in the years ahead. But because of Dr. King's death, I knew I needed to educate my students about this period of history, what he stood for, and how much remained for all of us to do today. So I went to Principal Carlson and asked permission to add more in my course material about Dr. King and his impact on America. I'm sure that he recognized how important this was to me as well as my students. With his blessings, this was done. So I initially taught this to just my classes but I started sharing my personal stories along with what was occurring in America in large group settings. This continued until Black History Month was officially recognized throughout the United States. So it was in 1976 that Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month. He said that the purpose of Black History Month was to make all Americans aware of the struggle for freedom and equal opportunity. So since the month of February was designate, designated as Black History Month, now both seventh and eighth grade teachers shared more about Black history to their students. I would lead assemblies for our students to watch the film Montgomery to Memphis, capturing the civil rights movement with a special emphasis on Dr. King's leadership in the movement. Dr. King touched on equality and a call for solidarity among all people. 
regardless of their standing or power in society. Dr. King planted in me the desire to strive for justice, unity, and empathy. Thinking about my early teaching, when I would introduce my classes to current events, I can only wonder what I would say to my students about two major events. On this January 6, 2021, a large group of protesters that believed that the election was full of fraud launched an attack on our capital. The action of the protesters led some to engage in what has been called an act of domestic terrorism. When historians and others reflect on the events of January 6, 2021, there will always be debates as to what role did President Trump play that led up to the attack on the halls of Congress. Also on this same day, in Georgia's runoff election, an African-American man, Raphael Warnock, and a Jewish man, John Ossoff, was voted into the U.S. Senate, giving Democrats control of the Senate. My question to anyone hearing my reflection, where were you and what were your feelings regarding this horrific challenge to the rules of law, to the rule of law and the orderly transition of power from one president to another? As an African-American man, I am reminded of the peaceful assembly of protesters in 1963 in Washington, D.C. that was to dramatize the need for new federal legislation to integrate African-Americans completely in American society and the marches in Selma in 65 to gain voting rights. These and others were nonviolent peaceful demonstrations. So contrast that to what we witnessed on this January 6, 2021. In the end, democracy won, not the violent mob action. I asked you to recognize and compare how law enforcement handled the violent mob as compared to Black Lives Matter movement. So when I think of the Black Lives Movement, I am reminded of Dr. King's letter while serving time uh, in Birmingham jail when he wrote his now famous letter and it was titled, Why We Can't Wait. You talk to most people today, they can definitely answer that question. So when referencing the attack on the Capitol, most Blacks point to a double standard. One was to call for changes in the criminal justice system, especially focused on unjust police tactics. And the other was an insurrection against the United States. No matter which side of this argument we choose, we must recognize that racial and political divide, the racial and the political divide that plague our nation today that has stymied real progress in the areas especially of justice and equality. So Dr. King would remind us in this quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It was in 1986 that I was introduced to a competitive student challenge called Black History Showdown. It was a competition with a college, high school, and middle school division. Students learned historical facts and events. Ames teams competed five consecutive years against teams from around the state, winning our division on several occasions. One year, I got to accompany uh, one of my students that won our division to Atlanta, Georgia to visit the MLK Center and the church 
where Dr. King served as co-pastor. And you can see in these photographs, this is a group of uh, one of several teams of students competing in the Black History Showdown from the middle school. And down here was me and students uh, in front of the marquee uh, at uh, the memorial uh, for the King Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Now this was an incredible experience. This furthered my resolve to a commitment of service to my community. Dr. King said, life's most persistent, persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And this is kind of a model that I have tried to fashion my life after. What are you doing for others? In January, 1991, as part of the Dr. Martin Luther King birthday events, I was honored to receive the 1991 Excellence Award, recognizing my years of teaching and coaching in the Ames Community School District, and for starting the Black History Showdown Quiz Bowl that included both seventh and eighth grade uh, and middle school students. They also acknowledged my role in helping to organize local observance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday and Black History Month activities. In 1988, I received the ISU Student Affairs Human Relations Committee Award, and in 1997, was honored to receive the Humanitarian of the Year uh, by the Ames Human Relations Commission and the City Council. So in this particular article, also in the Tribune, you'll notice that Dr. George Jackson, who coached the ISU, Black History Showdown team was honored, and Carly Tartikoff received the excellent award along with me, and she was very active uh, in the Iowa Civil Rights Division, but taught, uh, was an instructor at Iowa State. After 34 years of what I acknowledge was an incredible journey in Ames, I want to highlight just a few experiences out of many. So for this presentation, I'm just gonna name a few. Here is one. 1991, received the Iowa High School Athletic Association Coach Achievement Award for coaching the Ames High Boys basketball uh, to a 3A state championship. I was the first African-American coach to lead Ames, the Ames team to a 3A state championship. Someday, I hope there will probably be another one. In 1992, I was inducted into the Iowa High School Athletic Association Hall of Fame, Officials Hall of Fame. And in 2007, I was featured as one of the top basketball players in the St. Louis Public High School League in a publication in a book by Earl Austin's sport editor of the St. Louis American and sports reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I was truly honored to be included among such great players uh, in St. Louis history. And in 2017, I was inducted into the Iowa African-American Hall of Fame for outstanding contributions to African-Americans throughout the state of Iowa. This was founded in 1985, and the IAHF recognized outstanding achievements of African Americans with respect to enhancing the quality of life for all Iowans. What made this induction ceremony even more special was having my family, special friends, fraternity brothers, and former college mates present. Pardon me just a moment. My coaching background started at Welch Junior High. Where I coached 
football, girls and boys basketball and track. My first high school job was in 1975 when I was hired as the first girls Ames High softball coach. I took the job with the understanding that they would soon hire a veteran coach and I could remain on as his assistant. Bud Leg was then uh, hired after a successful coaching tenure at South Hamilton in Jewel, Iowa. Together, we developed a competitive softball program. In 1982, I was named the sophomore boys basketball coach, and in 1983, became the varsity coach. Coach Legg joined me as a valued assistant coach with the 88-89 team. The 88-89 team won the Metro Conference Championship, and in the 1991 team, as I mentioned earlier, won the 3A state championship. When I retired after 14 seasons, my record had a 143 win, 143 losses. This was the second best at that time uh, in Ames High School history. My coaching success would not have been possible without some outstanding assistant coaches. Bud Legg, John Walls, and Vance Downs were key. I also was a girl assistant track coach, girls assistant track coach serving under head coach Jim Dewey until I retired from the school district in 2000. The track squad won numerous Drake relays, conference and state championships. This was truly, uh, this was also true for the boys program coached by John Slutton. And Drake Relays will be coming up next week, I believe. And I hope that I can make it there to watch Ames compete again. So after 34 years of teaching and coaching, I retired from the Ames Community School District on June 2nd, 2000. It was brought to my attention that there was an opening on the Story County Board of Supervisors and that I should consider running for the board. I reached out to Jane Halliburton, one of the county supervisors, to discuss the duties and responsibilities of a school board member. After our meeting, I was excited about seeking a seat on the county board. I was successful in gaining enough signatures to get my name on the primary ballot. The next step was organizing my campaign committee. Due to my late start, both the Democratic and Republican parties had two candidates each and they were already campaigning. Sandy and Margot McNabb, both well-connected in the Democratic party agreed to serve as my co-chairs. Fundraising, and letting voters know about my key priorities were important. The caption before uh, was my first yard signs uh, that I uh, purchased. And this was in the Ames Tribune and it was part of how they interview various candidates uh, to share with the public uh, what we were all about. And for me, uh, a lifelong commitment to public service, compassionate leadership style, a passion for equity uh, were the cornerstones of who I was. I knocked on many doors meeting voters and was warmly received. Since I was well known due to my teaching, coaching basketball and officiating football, in many of these communities, I easily won the primary and was on my way to running in the no November general election. Fred Matisson was a Republican supervisor and I reached out to him as well. To my surprise, Fred took me to some of the smaller communities and introduced me to some of his friends. Many asked the question if I was a Democrat. And he said, yes, but I'm asking you to vote for him. I've known Wayne for, quote, I've known Wayne for many years 
and I believe he would be a good supervisor and good for Story County. Well, not only were the small towns, but many Republicans, they switched parties in the primary and voted for me. And so I was well on my way. And then I was the winner in the November general election and would take the oath of office in January of 2001. It's hard to put in words what an honor it was for me to serve the citizens of Story County as the first African-American elected official to the Board of Supervisors and to my knowledge, only the second in the state's history. I was first elected in 2000 and re-elected to serve for 16 years. During my tenure on the board, I served with the following outstanding supervisors, Jane Halliburton, Dennis Ballantyne, Don Tom, James Stroman, Rick Sanders, Paul Toot, and Marty Chitty. I was blessed to work with outstanding elected officials, department heads, and county employees. So over the years, I represented Story County on many, uh, on various boards and commissions. I wanted to highlight just a few. I was appointed at the state level by Governor Vilsack, Culver, and Branstad to serve several committees and boards. In 2010, I chaired the Disproportionate Minority Contact Committee known as the DMC. I chaired this for five years. We were charged to assess the extent of which minority youth are overrepresented in the juvenile justice system. And I was later appointed to the Governor's Implementation Committee, charged with reviewing recommendations from the Youth, Race, and Detention Task Force, and charged with providing quarterly reports to then Governor Culver. I was involved with the Iowa Association of Counties and uh, County Supervisors and the National Association of Counties. My involvement there was really too numerous to list for this particular presentation. I continue to be a proud member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People the NAACP, and a member of the Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, and a member of the Ames Noon Rotary. In 2008, now I'm going on with a, another special recognition. In 2008, I was recognized as one of African Americans, lead, uh, the, one of the African American leaders in Iowa. I was honored to be asked to join a statewide coalition of elected officials to support then candidate Barack Obama. So in 2009, I attended the presidential inauguration in DC where President Obama was sworn in as the 44th president of the United States. Also attending the presidential in, uh, inaugural Midwestern Ball. So here in this folder, you see a caption of President Obama, myself, and the former mayor uh, of uh, Wally Loney, uh, Ziering, and the official invitation that I received uh, to come to the inauguration. And down below uh, is the uh, ticket that you had to have that admitted you to the Midwest Ball. This certainly was one of the most unforgettable experiences in my life. The pride I had seeing a person that looked like me serving in the White House was unimaginable. But also in 2012, I was selected as one of 35 people to President Barack Obama's African American for Obama Council. Again, charged to uh, recruit uh, other African Americans uh, in the election coming up. 
in 2017, I was awarded, uh, excuse me, just going back uh, to the Midwest Ball. You can see Edna and I all decked out and uh, Don uh, and Debbie Gitchell uh, is joining me in this photograph while we attended the ball. There were several others from Ames that were also in attendance at the ball uh, and it was a special evening. In 2017, the Iowa Association of Counties awarded me their most prestigious award, the Golden Eagle Award, created to recognize and honor individuals who have provided extraordinary public service to county government. I was the eighth recipient and, and the third elected official from Story County to receive this award. Supervisor Jane Halliburton, which is to, on the left, was the first recipient in 2010 and recorder Sue Vandercap was the second in 2015. Surrounded by family, Story County elected officials and county department heads, friends and the wife of the man that nominated me, Molly Toot helped to make this day even more special. So receiving an honor like this and hearing words of praise from my colleagues were priceless and unforgettable. And also pictured here with Jane and I is Linda Langston, at the, who was past um, supervisor for Lynn County and went on to become NACO president. Little did I know back in 2001 when County Supervisor Jane Halliburton encouraged me to get involved with the Iowa Association of Counties, ISAC, and the supervisor's affiliate that I would one day be recognized by both for my leadership and service. In 2018, the League of Women Voters of Story County, of Ames and Story County, presented Making Democracy Work Award to both Edna and I for outstanding contributions over decades as engaged and dedicated citizens. This award also recognized our outstanding lifelong commitment to civil rights. And in 2020, the Ames Chamber of Commerce presented the Diversity and Inclusion Award to both Edna and I for leadership in developing inclusive organizations and being a champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion in Ames and in Story County. Since retiring, I am still giving back to our community. Currently serving on the Ames History Museum Board NAMI of Central Iowa Board, and again, serving on the Ames Human Relations Commission. I could never imagine that coming to Ames in 1966, that I would be given the opportunity to be of service to our community and state in such numerous ways. My life could have been quite different than what it turned out given the widespread segregation practices and racial inequalities. Today, I am honored with what I see. Today, I am troubled, excuse me, with what I see as an attempt to undo some of the gains this country achieved as federal legislators, uh, as federal legislation, excuse me, were enacted then to attempt to provide equal protection under the law especially for African-Americans. I reference again the congressional passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the Fair Housing Act of 68. These acts actually ended uh, legal segregation but gained federal oversight and enforcement of voter registration and electoral practices in states or areas with a history of discriminatory practices that ended discrimination in renting or buying housing. 
So today, many state legislatures are proposing legislation to restrict voter access by placing restrictions on absentee voting under the disguise of preventing voter fraud. History is repeating itself where laws and practices denied African-Americans their right to vote in order to remain in power. The future is unknown, but I am grateful for past opportunities and experiences during my time in this community. I have often said that I have been truly blessed and have had opportunities beyond anything that I might imagine, have imagined. I am so thankful for the love and support given by my family. Without that support, I would not have been able to pursue the various opportunities available to me. With all that I accomplished, I, I now realize that I missed many valuable hours with my wife and children. And in this photograph, my youngest son, Aaron, is to the left, my wife, Edna, myself, my daughter, Danielle, and her brother, Antoine. This picture is about time with family. During, my fam during family gatherings and listening to their stories about growing up here in Ames, it was clear that I missed a lot. I'm determined to treasure every hour we can spend together. Years from now, some may ask, who was the first African-American to serve in this or that role? And my name might come up. I can only hope that other African-Americans will follow in my footsteps. This picture to the left happens to be uh, our traditional trek to Jessup, Maryland at my son's house, Antoine, and the family would gather there for Thanksgiving dinner. And here to the right is uh, some of the family members uh, getting ready uh, to have a delicious meal. Finally, I leave with this poem. Several versions became popular in its use by the Reverend Jesse Jackson as part of Push Excel, a program designed to motivate black students. It says, I am somebody. I was somebody when I came. I will be a better somebody when I leave. I am powerful and I am strong. I deserve the education that I get here. I have things to do, people to impress and places to go by Rita Pearson. Now, not only did I like the early part of that, but I love the ending. I have things to do, people to impress, and places to go. Thank you, one and all, for listening tonight. And so now I don't know if we are ready for questions or not, if we have time. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, Casey, to... Uh, handle that if in case I did get questions. I know it was a little long and I apologize. That is perfectly fine, Wayne. Thank you for such a great presentation. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, so I'll give people a couple of minutes. If you want to, if you have any questions for Wayne, please go ahead and put those either in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, there are some really nice comments in the chat, and I did save those, so I'll share those with you okay. um, later, Wayne, if you don't have the chance to look at those. Super. Um, but I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Oh, um, here's one. 
In the early 1970s, um, did you feel like you were living in a bubble in Ames? Uh, in a way, uh, it's kind of hard to be answered because I was so focused on trying to be the best person that I possibly could be, but I also knew that the image that I projected could have ramifications for people like me that might follow. So in some ways, uh, that is what really was uh, uh, motivating me. Now, compared to some of my friends and other surrounding things, you could say in a way Ames was really a bubble, but underneath the surface, there were similar things um, and I just did not personally experience them. Talking to some other students, particularly students at Iowa State, uh, they shared some experiences that I never experienced uh, living and growing up here uh, in Ames. So while we like to think that Ames was the utopia and was there to meet all, it wasn't true for everybody. Uh, but maybe because I was a teacher and a coach, uh, that gave me a level of acceptance that other people didn't have. But thank you for the question. A couple more questions have come in. Um, how would you compare the political landscape in Iowa right now with what you experienced in the late 1960s? Well, <clears throat> I'm seeing signs uh, that history is trying to repeat itself. Uh, and that's troubling. Uh, yes, no, no, we don't have to deal with segregation but we're dealing with repressive, restricted laws and practices that make it difficult for people of color uh, to have a fair shot, particularly in the area of housing and uh, job acquisitions and certainly promotions uh, into jobs. And so if you look around the state of Iowa, we are a very small percent, maybe three or 4% of the population. And yet most African-Americans live in uh, your larger uh, urban areas. And yes, they do uh, face some challenges, uh, but they are different. But the, the, what has to happen in this day and age is we need like-minded people of all races, like Dr. King said, to come together because we are better when we work together in unison. And when we see signs of racism and prejudice uh, rear its ugly head, we need to speak up. We cannot any longer be complicit and silent. Uh, and that's one of the greatest fears that I have right now is what is the next few years gonna be like? As many of you might know, you know, I'm reaching that point in time age-wise where I'm a seasoned veteran, but I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around. But I do want to see a better world for my children and for all children. And so uh, I think there are challenges out there in Iowa uh, have been able to maybe skirt under the uh, uh, idea of Iowa nice, et cetera. And that's nice depending on who you talk to. And if you're a person of color, sometimes they don't necessarily think that Iowa is Iowa nice. Thank you for the question. Um, who were some of your colleagues at Ames High that you respected the most? At Ames High? Well, that is a good question. First of all, if you go, I taught at the middle school and certainly Don Carlson, Jim Amford, Gary Janelle uh, and were extremely very important. Uh, Dale Geis um, and Thelma and uh, Moore, Martha Geis that I taught with and team with for a long time and, and, and the various coaches. But at the high school level, since I only coached there, obviously uh, many years with Bud Leg, very, very, very special friend. Uh, Phil Johnson taught math. Uh, but also coached at, at high school, and we refereed for over 25 years, very close. The, all the administration I knew, Dale Tramp was a very special friend. He, my son, 
Antoine and his son were very close. And so I had uh, uh, great respect uh, for Dale and Eileen Tramp. And in recent years, some of the uh, coaches that I got to know on a very personal level uh, stood out. But I do remember that Jim Dewey used to invite me to come uh, and talk to his classes back in the day. Uh, and so uh, he and another guy, Kurt Smaltz, that I coached with uh, was another person that I had a lot of respect for. Uh, and of course, you know, we had other excellent teachers in the history department. I can't go and name all of them, but there were many, many that uh, I uh, got to know, uh, respected. I think they respected me. And uh, together, we all uh, tried to make Ames the best that we possibly could. Thank you for the question. Um, can you describe your children's lives um, while they were growing up in Ames, what they experienced? Uh, you know, this is really challenging and difficult. Uh, I've heard that it wasn't as rosy as I may have thought. Uh, can you imagine that they did not bring some of their issues to me, to my attention? because I was a teacher and I taught each of my children. So the wife got heard most of what was happening. And anyone that knows her today know that uh, she's gonna set people straight, especially when it comes to messing with my children. But they did have some, some issues. Uh, I will say that my daughter, as soon as she graduated, uh, within a year, she left St. Louis, uh, left Ames for St. Louis uh, because she was looking for a different environment, uh, more uh, uh, culturally uh, related uh, to people of color, et cetera. Uh, but my, I did ask my children that question and they've been a little bit reluctant to really tell me just how uh, they, they felt about things. They had some friends that were very dear to them. They are still friends with that group, but it was a smaller circle. And also, I think when you are a teacher's son, they, that kind of puts you into a little different uh, a light uh, in, in some regards, even though they never said that me being a teacher, even when they were in my classes at the middle school, created a problem for them. But uh, someday I hope that they will really sit down and just tell me exactly how they felt about uh, things in, in, in Ames. But I will just say, yes, there were issues that they dealt with. Uh, and thank God that my wife was available uh, to be the mediator and guide them in the right way uh, because they survived and they're doing very well today. Thank you for the question, though. All right. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, why do you think there is still such a lack of um, Black D1 football coaches today? Uh, part of the power struggle structure, uh, there's this mindset, just like uh, historically, people didn't think uh, uh, Blacks could play quarterback. Uh, in professional football or in college. Uh, there were always certain roles that we were relegated to as people of color. And so even though uh, in professional NBA, we've had some uh, African-Americans, very successful uh, coaches over the years, I'm seeing a trend uh, now that uh, those numbers are dwindling quite a bit. I can't really put my finger on it, uh, but it comes back to the decision making. Who are the ones that are making the decisions? And oftentimes you don't have people in the athletic departments uh, that are like me that may be in a position to uh, also help hire a coach or speak kindly of someone and so I think people tend, some of the coaches like to 
perhaps go into certain kind of communities and environment, environments where they're going to have a, a more community support uh, than what they might have uh, in some of the other institutions. But I think it is starting to get better. If I'm, I'm seeing some signs of hiring that is taking place now, and uh, some of these are African-American coaches, uh, but I'm concerned about the NFL uh, if we're going to see uh, more than, what is it, three now? Uh, that might be, I might have missed one uh, from that standpoint. Good question, though. I'll, I'll do some more research on that. All right. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, who hired you as the high school basketball coaching job? And do you feel um, like your race ever played a factor in you getting hired or ever affected your opportunities in life? Well, you know, that is a good question. Um, see, Dave, uh, uh, Tom, Tom Jorgensen, uh, I think, uh, uh, was around at that particular time, uh, but Ralph Farrar ultimately uh, had the uh, final say. Uh, I had applied for a job previous, the high school job, while teaching and coaching at the at the middle school, and they told me that the reason I wasn't hired was because I had no high school experience. That was the answer. So. Uh, when the sophomore job opened, uh, someone at the high school reached out and asked if I was interested, and I said, yes, I was, and that opened the door in 1983, 82, and then in 83, uh, there was an unfortunate uh, situation, and the uh, high school coach uh, uh, was, was not continuing, and the opening occurred, and then I was named a high school uh, boys coach in 84 uh, and uh, spent a very successful year. So I don't think my race ever became an issue uh, uh, to my knowledge during uh, my coaching tenure in any of the sports in Ames High. Uh, and I, I just felt uh, very strongly uh, that that was never an issue, but to remember exactly who it was that, uh, I, you know, I just can't recall. I'll, I'll have to go back and do some thinking about exactly that. I know Ralph Arar, uh was very instrumental, but I can't even remember who the actual athletic director was at that time. Okay. All right. Um... Thank you so much again, Wayne, um, for being our speaker tonight and for taking so many questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, or if you think of other questions, anybody who's attending or want to send any comments over, um, just feel free um, to send us an email at info at aimshistory.org, and we'll get those questions and comments over to Wayne. Okay. And finally, one last thing. I am in the process of writing down more uh, and, and we'll leave that in the archives with the Ames History uh, Museum. Uh, I did have to shorten a lot of my presentation uh, for this. Uh, so there, there is a lot more to my story. And someday I might get someone who knows about writing a book that can sit down and really help me really uh, do, do a better job. But Again, I want to thank each and every one for taking the time and listening in tonight. And again, thank you uh, to the museum, to uh, both Casey, Alex, and especially Sharon uh, for their help. And I even had a little outside help that I need to give a special shout out that helped me with this final product. Uh, Jessica Reynolds, uh, Tiffany Meredith, and of course my wife, along with Sharon Worth. She did a a yeoman's job. Okay. Thanks, Wayne. I think your uh, your story is definitely worthy of a book. So I encourage you to to find someone to help you out with that and get that all written down. Okay. Thank you. Um. So thanks again, everybody, for attending. And um, like I mentioned, this program was recorded. So be looking for that in your email tomorrow. And then, um. 
I want to encourage everybody to also um, look at our website calendar, aimshistory.org slash calendar to get some more information about upcoming programs. Um, we have another lecture series program uh, coming up on April 28th. So um, I encourage you all to check that out and um, we hope to see you all again at the museum or online soon. Thanks everybody. Okay.